The following is a CNN special report. One more big smile. That's pretty. The face of little Madeline McCann captured the world's attention. Five days into their tranquil getaway, tragedy struck. The search is underway for a three year old British girl. Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home. The high profile worldwide search. I know where she could be. She's still alive. The shocking twists. Police are focusing their attention on two suspects Madeline's mom and dad. The theories. Somebody knows what's happened and the unsettling questions. The not knowing is what kills you, the not knowing. All eyes turn to this sleepy seaside village for answers. My message to the McCanns is there's still hope. A CNN special report, Missing Madeline McCann. Praia de Luz is one of the villages in Portugal that had long been just a little fishing village. It attracts a lot of expatriate tourists, particularly from Germany, Holland, and the UK. It's an easy, safe, relaxed place. Quite a small community, a few restaurants, beautiful beach. It just got everything that a family would want. In late April 2007, along with three other families, Kate and Jerry McCann, their two-year-old twins, Sean and Amelie, and nearly four-year-old daughter, Madeline, traveled on spring holiday to picturesque Praia de Luz, Portugal. Each family had rented an apartment at the Ocean Club, a small resort in the heart of the village. It's pretty open. You've got a pool, you've got the restaurant where they all went. With nine adults and a combined eight children, the McCann's party was hard to miss. All four of their rented apartments were clustered together in block five. And this was their apartment on the, That's apartment on the corner of 5A. here. Julian Paribanez is a private investigator. He says the location of the McCann's flat put the family at risk. What made this apartment, 5A, more vulnerable than some of the others in the complex? Well, it makes it more vulnerable because it's in the corner and there's a lot of places that you can be watching the, the apartment without being in notice. But from the McCann's view, the location of apartment 5A had all the makings of a perfect family retreat. The first days of their vacation went exceptionally well, probably just exactly as they had hoped. They're both quite sporty, they enjoy running, they, they enjoy tennis, and the resort offered them all of those options. It offered plenty of options for the children as well. Madeline McCann spent most of her days with the kids club under the supervision of resort personnel. However, at night, the McCanns opted out of the Ocean Club's childcare. The McCann party made the decision amongst themselves that that might be disruptive to their children's sleep patterns. So they thought, we can just do this ourselves. At 8.30 every night after putting their kids to bed, the McCanns joined their friends for dinner at the on-site tapas restaurant, while the children were all left alone sleeping in their respective apartments. So they decided to mount a half hour checking system of all of their children. So one member of the group would get up and go and check and check on all their children, come back, another one would go every half an hour. And all I can say is it just felt so safe. You know, it was a family friendly resort. For me, you know, if your children are asleep upstairs in a bedroom and you're dining in the garden, you're out of sight and you can't hear them. Um, and that's the similar thing to me. We measured it. Where they were sitting having dinner was about 60 yards as the crow flies from apartment 5A on the corner there. Could they see the apartment from, from there? They could see it, mm -hmm. but they couldn't see the, the windows because there's a lot of bushes and everything. It was across the pool and some bushes, but you could see the doors. Sliding glass doors the McCanns had left unlocked. They left them unlocked because they wanted to access for the checking and they were going in every half an hour. It's a judgment call. A judgment call that would haunt the McCanns forever. All I can say is, I mean, if I'd have thought there was any risk at all, you know, it, it just wouldn't have happened. I mean, there's no one more than us that I'd want to 
change what we did that night, nice, obviously. It is that environment where you feel so safe, so secure, so at ease. Was it right? Well, we know the answer to that now, don't we? May 3, the Thursday, began as what appeared to be a typical vacation day. Kate and Jerry McCann got to spend some time together, playing tennis, lounging at the pool. In the evening, when Jerry McCann went to take a tennis lesson, Kate picked up the children at the kids' club and brought them back to the apartment to get them ready for bed. They sat on the patio, had their first glass of wine for the night, and got ready and went down to the tapas restaurant for half past eight. Kate told one of her friends about the troubling incident with Madeline during the morning. That morning at breakfast, Madeline had asked her parents a startling question. She said, Mummy, when Sean, that's her little brother, and I cried last night, why didn't you come? Did that mean that they were upset by something the previous night? They wondered if they should go out again that evening, um, but Madeline seemed entirely at ease. They certainly had no intimation or reason to think it could be anything more sinister. They then carried on with the evening and began the process of the, the regular checks on the children that they'd been doing all week. According to the timeline provided by the group at dinner that night, Jerry McCann conducted a check at roughly 9.05 p.m. So I actually came in and Madeline was just at the top of the bed here when I'd left her lying and the covers were folded down and she had her cuddle cat and blankie were just by her head and it's terrible because I um, I had one of those really proud father moments where I just thought, you know, she, I just thought you're absolutely beautiful and I love you. On his way back down to dinner, Jerry spotted an acquaintance and stopped for a quick chat when another parent, Jane Tanner, walked by. When Jane Tanner left the restaurant that night to take her turn at checking on the children, it was about 9.15 p.m. She made her way up this street, and that's when she says she noticed a man walking along that street heading in that direction. She described him as carrying a child in his arms, a child that didn't have any shoes on, was about the same age as Madeline McCann, and was wearing pink pajamas very similar to Madeline's pajamas. At the time, she didn't think much of it. Then about 9.30, 9.25, Matthew Oldfield was going upstairs. He said to Kate, I'll take it, I'll, I'll go and check on your three. He went into the McCann's apartment. He went to the door of the children's bedroom, but he did not go in. He looked in, he saw the twins who were in cots through the door, but he didn't put his head round to the left where he would have seen if Madeline was there or not. And I'm sure it's something he regrets uh, massively. Less than 30 minutes later, it was Kate McCann's turn. I went back to do a check at 10 o'clock, um, and I went through the patio doors at the back just noticed that the, the door to the children's bedroom was quite far open. And just as I was about to close it, it kind of slammed. As if like a gust of wind had shut it. Her heart sank then at that point because that was all wrong. Everything was wrong. And then I went back just to open the door again a little bit. Just as I did that, I noticed that the shutter was open, the window was open. And then she saw that Madeline's bed was empty. And what did you think in that moment? I thought someone's taken it. Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her mummy, daddy, brother and sister. The search for Madeline begins next. Okay, spin around, darling. Okay. Right round. Oh, yes, I can see your wings. Give us a big smile. <laughs> oh, yeah. One more. Big smile. That's Madeline Beth McCann. Oh, we took a very big toys. Mm. Santa was a pink toys. Mm -hmm. 
born on May 12, 2003, to parents who adored her. Madeline, you know, I know she was our first. She's absolutely incredible and a real character. Who says uh huh? <laughs> Say yes, Daddy. <laughs> brought an incredible amount of joy into our family. A family Jerry and Kate McCann desperately wanted. They met in medical school in the 1990s. He was a cardiac specialist and Kate a family doctor. The McCanns married in December 1998 but struggled to conceive. The McCanns tried very, very hard to have a child. What did they go through? They needed to go through IVF. They had a few problems before Madeline arrived, um, which made her all the more special in their eyes. I mean, this was a child they really wanted. Absolutely. Less than two years after Madeline, twin siblings Sean and Amelie were born. Cut the eggs together, one, two, three. I just can't believe I went, you know, through five years of desperately trying to have children to suddenly having three. It was great, it was just lovely. We were just so happy. A happy, busy life for the McCann family of five, who packed up for a relaxing vacation in the spring of 2007. Oopsie, you all right? It was the first time I'd ever been to Portugal, but all the family and friends I knew that I'd been there said it's, you know, it's a lovely country and it's really safe and it's for families. What started as an idyllic family holiday turned into a nightmare on May 3rd, 2007, when Madeline vanished from the apartment just days before her fourth birthday. May 3rd, 2007. At 10 p.m. that night, the desperate search began. Every minute felt like an hour and every hour felt you know, like a day. And you know, you know from other cases where people, the police say the first 24 hours is critical and you just, you just imagine the worst. In these cases, time is the enemy. Ernie Allen counseled the McCanns early on. The greatest likelihood of recovering a child safely occurs in those early minutes, those early hours, the early days. But even the Portuguese police acknowledge those early hours of the investigation were full of blunders. There were lots of mistakes made. The crime scene was not secure. I think there was physical evidence there that would have been recovered if they had applied rule one of the police investigative rule book, which is you secure the crime scene. According to investigators, up to 20 people traipsed in and out of the crime scene that night. Windows were closed, doors were open and shut. They were searching for a child. They weren't worrying about preserving evidence. And there were other missteps, like collecting fingerprints without wearing gloves. The roadblocks weren't set up for 12 hours. The Spanish border is an hour and a half away. Holidaymakers were allowed to return to their own homes in Holland and Germany in the UK without ever having been interviewed. Part of the problem in those early hours? Authorities didn't yet realize that what happened was a crime. When I got there in the morning, we were all convinced the little girl had walked away. She'd be found a couple of hours later. Paul Luckman was one of the first journalists to arrive on the scene. So in the early days, were authorities actually looking for a kidnapper? No, no. I don't think it had occurred to anybody. But it had occurred to the McCanns. I knew my child had been taken. It's quite hard to, to get somebody else to believe that. On the very night Madeline disappeared, Kate and Jerry McCann and their friends started trying to reach out to the press. They are well-educated, middle-class people with lots of friends and contacts. Just hours after Madeline's disappearance, her image was broadcast and emailed around the world. She was arguably the first missing child case of the internet era. Within minutes of her going missing, relatives were able to send high-quality definition video of her 
uh, posting them on websites, Facebook pages, and sending them to news desks. We're just hearing that a search is underway for a three-year-old British girl. She went missing last night. Hundreds of people have been searching. By the next morning, news carried the first reports from Praia de Luz of a little girl having disappeared. We begin with the case of Madeleine McCann. She's gone missing in the Algarve area of Portugal. Within 24 hours, the tiny village was swarming with media, and the McCanns gave their first press conference. Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her mummy, daddy, brother and sister. Four days after Madeline vanished, Kate made another appeal. We beg you to let Madeline come home. We need our Madeline. But did it help or hurt? Kate and Jerry, they were very serious. They didn't cry when they were on the press. And that's something that we, we didn't understand too much here in, well, in the south of Europe. People were very sentimental and usually mothers cry. And that made people suspicious. Early on, one of the major criticisms of the McCanns was that um, they were very stoic, um, even, even cold. They were told very early on that whoever has committed this awful crime often watches parental appeals and can get a sexual thrill out of seeing the distress that they've caused the victims or their family. Kate and Jerry were told, if you can avoid showing overt emotion, it's better to do that. Please give our little girl back. Por favor, devolva a nossa menina. When we return, the focus turns to Kate and Jerry. Days after Madeleine McCann's disappearance, one of the largest searches in Portugal's history was underway. During the first weeks, there were thousands or at least hundreds of people involved all over the country to rescue Madeleine McCann. Then, 11 days after the disappearance, a potential break in the case. Portuguese police, also known as the PJ, named the first Arguido. Loose translation, formal suspect. Who was Robert Murat? Robert Murat is a British uh, Portuguese resident of Praia de Luz who lived in 2007 in a home owned by his mother, only some 100 yards or so from apartment 5A. She went missing last night. After <laughs> Madeline's disappearance from Luz made the morning news, Robert Murat walked out to his yard. That's when I actually met an English guy that had known the family, and I had mentioned to him that I do speak Portuguese, so he asked me if I'd mind lending a hand. I have a daughter the same age, and if it happened to me, I would want and expect everybody to help me. One of the British newspaper reporters who was there became suspicious of Robert Murat's behavior called the PJ and alerted them. Those suspicions snowballed after three of the McCann's friends reported seeing Murat near 5A the night of the disappearance. Murat denied being there after dark, but there's good reason he may have looked familiar. He lived next to it, 100 meters away. Well, he's always there, he lives there. It's a small village. The PJ searched his home and Murat spent more than 19 hours being questioned by police. But the media scrutiny was far worse. With any comments at all, sir? Oh. Meanwhile, Jerry and Kate McCann took the hunt beyond borders. We want to do everything in our power to help the search for Madeline. Spain, Morocco, the Netherlands, and Germany and even an audience with the Pope, all aimed at one goal, keeping Madeline's face in the news. If you have seen this little girl, please could you go to your local authorities or police 
using media dramatically increased the likelihood that somebody would come forward with information that could lead to her safe recovery. Reported sightings of Madeline poured in from around the world, but one theory gained traction, that Jerry and Kate McCann were responsible for what happened to their daughter. How do you deal with the fact that more and more people seem to be pointing the finger at you? In July 2007, British sniffer dogs trained to detect the scent of blood and cadavers were sent here to Portugal to help with the investigation. What they found led to a major shift in the case. The dogs alerted to tiny specks of blood in apartment 5A. She will find anybody's blood, any human blood. According to its handler, one dog reacted to potential blood or human remains in the trunk of the McCann's rental car, even though they didn't rent the car until three weeks after Madeline went missing. Conclusion of the research at that time. The girl died at that night in the apartment, and the parents know. It was a turning point from the point of view of the Portuguese investigators under Chief Investigator Gonzalo Amaral. Whether rightly or wrongly, the, the Portuguese concluded at that time that Madeleine McCann had died in the apartment and that the parents had sought to cover it up and remove the body, remove the evidence. False media reports circulated that DNA found in the rental car matched Madeleine's. It would take almost a year for the correct DNA results to be released. In the meantime, the damage was done. Tonight, a major break. Police are focusing their attention on two suspects, Madeline's mom and dad. Four months after Madeline's disappearance, her parents were named formal suspects. They were shocked. Disbelief, first of all. Um, and then it was just, I mean, it was devastation. It was devastation that suddenly, if they were looking at us, who was looking for Madeline? And I thought, there's no one looking for my little girl. Two days after being named suspects, the McCanns returned to England, clutching their twins, but without Madeline. We have played no part in the disappearance of our lovely daughter, Madeline. Fourteen months passed since Madeline's disappearance, with no progress and no charges filed. In July 2008, stunning news. The Portuguese Attorney General was closing the case. At a certain point, I realized that there were no reliable clues that were any more solid than others. It reminded me of a cat trying to catch its own tail. We were running around in circles without any success. His decision cleared all suspects including Robert Murat. I think he was more of a victim. A victim? Yeah, they needed someone to blame. This left me completely destroyed. Not only myself, my family. It's hard to describe how utterly despairing it was to be named our Guido and subsequently portrayed in the media as suspects in our own daughter's abduction. But the McCanns weren't done fighting. We looked forward to scrutinizing the police files to see what has actually been done. Coming up, the McCanns go it alone. Are they new? Little Madeline McCann was gone. Wow. Desperate to get her back, Kate and Jerry McCann shared their daughter with the world. Why do you think this, this case captured the world's attention? Her smile, her laugh, was accessible to all of us. And so we all felt we knew her a little bit. These are actually the pajamas that Madeline was wearing when she was taken. But the massive amounts of publicity came with some criticism. You know, how much is too much publicity when a child's life is at stake? Media, and particularly in the print media, it's, they've lost sight of what it is. We're a real family. 
It's been a heinous crime and there's a little, completely innocent four-year-old girl who's, who's missing. From the beginning, the British media had a ferocious appetite for anything related to the McCann case. Many salacious newspaper headlines even implied the McCanns had something to do with the death or disappearance of their daughter. So in 2008, the McCanns sued several of those papers for libel and won. Many issued front page apologies and awarded more than $1 million into a fund established to find Madeline. Jerry and Kate weren't the only victims of false reports. First our Guido Robert Murat was also awarded over $1 million in libel damages. And their friends, the Tapas Seven, settled a case for six figures. But what the McCanns wanted most was answers. It was all the clues that they gave us. So, the so they turned to private investigators. Private Julian Parabanez was a field was agent on the case. State. Did you get the sense that they were desperate for answers? They thought that nobody was searching for Madeline, so they needed to, to find someone to start looking for her. An awful lot of work was done. Teams went to Morocco, they went all over the Mediterranean and various countries, following up leads, tip-offs. And the little girl had a hat on, and she looked like Madeline McCann. I know where she could be. She's still alive. Yeah. Parents. From reported sightings to psychic visions, Parabanez chased down dozens of possible leads. Then, his boss made this bold claim on television. We are 100% sure that she's alive. I know the kidnapper, and we know where he is. We know who he is, and we know uh, how he has done it. I was shocked, embarrassed, and ashamed. Why is that? Because we didn't have any clue whatsoever of who took her. A dearth of clues, dead ends, and dashed hopes, hallmarks of the McCann case. And it didn't help that the Portuguese authorities shared almost no information until the summer of 2008. Portuguese police, who had been working under conditions of quite extreme secrecy, because that is their judicial law, released the files to the public and the press. So suddenly, there was a tidal wave of thousands of pages of police files, all in Portuguese, that anyone could examine. An open record detailing a massive effort, according to Portuguese police. It's public, you can see what has been done, it reflects hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of work by the authorities. The McCanns spent more than $100,000 to translate the files to English, and then countless hours pouring through them. And I was desperate to go through this myself because I knew that I'd be going through it with a fine-tooth comb. The open case files meant vindication for the McCanns. The DNA that was found in the trunk of the vehicle, it was inclusive. There was absolutely no evidence that the, the DNA in question belonged to Madeline. And amidst the stacks of papers, the McCanns found some hope. The most important thing that came out when the files were released, there's absolutely no evidence anywhere to suggest that Madeline has been physically harmed. With faith renewed their daughter could still be out there and alive, Jerry and Kate release this photo of what Madeline McCann could look like at age six, two years after she went missing. And I just think it's so vital and so fair for Madeline that we don't give up on her. Coming up, the power of a public appeal to the highest authorities. May 2011, four years after she vanished from a Portuguese resort, Madeline McCann was still missing, and the only ones still searching were her parents. It is a fact that no law enforcement agency or police force has been looking for Madeline for three years. We've been doing it on our own. But Kate and Jerry McCann weren't giving up. They were taking action. I'm absolutely confident that Kate's book will help the search both directly and indirectly. Kate McCann's book was really a, a cry for help, but at the end it included a plea 
a plea to reopen the case. All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You. Thank you. A plea the McCanns would aim next at Britain's prime minister. In a letter printed in one of the big tabloid newspapers in the UK, they essentially begged Prime Minister Cameron to open up a review of the case. I believe there's bits of information that haven't been linked up to each other, which could then be significant. And in the end, David Cameron did respond. Within 24 hours of McCann's open letter appearing in the press, he had authorized the Metropolitan Police to undertake a review of the case. In 2011, Scotland Yard ordered a review called Operation Grange. Their task? To assume nothing and re-examine the case from the very beginning. Operation Grange was headed by Detective Chief Inspector Andy Redwood, who had come from the Homicide Squad. Uh, we went to see him at that point. By then, co-authors Anthony Summers and Robin Swan were in the midst of their own investigation researching their book, Looking for Madeline. It was clear that he was a very methodical officer who had pinpointed numerous, indeed thousands, of things that he felt in the case needed to be checked. Just one year into Redwood's review, new signs of hope. We believe that there is a possibility that Madeline is alive. Alive a possibility that would quickly push investigators in a whole new direction. We have identified 38 persons of interest. In 2013, Scotland Yard's review of the case turned into an official investigation. By then, they had learned there had been an uptick in burglaries in the same area where the McCanns were staying. That led British investigators to pursue a new theory. Could Madeline have been the victim of a botched burglary? There are active burglary rings in Portugal, but Portugal doesn't, the Algarve doesn't want people to know that. They want people like the McCanns, naive, wonderful, upscale tourists to come there and stay in their beautiful hotels. It's really, really, really a safe country. In 2016, we had only uh, less than 100 murders uh, in all over the country for 10 million people. Yet according to British investigators, in the four months leading up to Madeline's disappearance, burglaries had quadrupled in the village where the McCanns were staying. One of the theories was that this could have been a burglary gone wrong. Do you believe that at all, that that's possible? No. You go inside to pick up a wallet. You don't go out with a kid. What the hell are you going to do with a kid? By the fall of 2013, Scotland Yard wasn't publicly ready to rule anything out, except for one critical part of their timeline. According to Redwood, the man Jane Tanner described seeing the night Madeline vanished was actually this man, an innocent father who was carrying his own child home from a nursery around that same time. We believe in a convincing way that this is not Madeline's abductor. And so he focused attention, rather, on another sighting. An Irish family leaving dinner that night around 10 p.m. reported seeing a man carrying a child towards the ocean. But who that man was, to this day, is still unknown. That's the bigger question. And precisely. Another big question detectives were trying to answer, were the McCanns being watched? There are two witnesses who say, independent of one another, that they saw what they described as a very ugly, pockmarked or spotty-skinned man watching apartment 5A. Another witness reported having seen suspicious men on a balcony near the McCann's apartment, just hours before Madeline disappeared. Meanwhile, an upstairs neighbor saw another man acting very suspiciously in the little pathway between the pool garden and apartment 5A. And there was more. British police released a sketch of one of the men they say had approached nearby apartments, asking residents for donations to a local orphanage. Now, there was no such orphanage. So clearly, these men were involved in some kind of a crime possibly just burglary, but possibly something else. We've got a lot of work to do. 
We've also done a lot of work. We are wholly committed to making a difference in this case. We are fighting for Madeleine McCann. A fight that has lasted far longer than any had hoped. There's no evidence that she's dead. So certainly from my point of view, you know, somebody knows what's happened. Seven long years after tragedy struck this Portuguese paradise, the search for Madeleine McCann appeared to be heating up. Can you tell us anything about the witnesses at all? British detectives had just arrived for the questioning of 11 key witnesses. I'm sorry, I've got no comment this morning. After shelving the case six years earlier, the Portuguese police had recently joined Scotland Yard and reopened their own investigation. Portuguese law enforcement official is confirming to CNN that British police want to interview three individuals. They had identified three known burglars, known thieves, who were operating near the Ocean Club, very close to the time that Madeleine had disappeared. Those men were questioned, but never charged. In the summer of 2014, officials returned to Praia de Luz to conduct a week-long ground search. The clear implication was that they were looking for perhaps human remains. The visuals of it were police searching undergrowth. This is dreadful. But they were there to rule things out. Has that been double-checked? Has this been checked? Did you do this? Did you do that? Another step in a painful process of elimination. Do the McCanns get their hopes up with every move? They learned long ago not to get their hopes up because sadly there have been far too many disappointments. Since 2007, there have been a staggering 9,000 reported sightings of Madeline. Scotland Yard alone has looked at nearly 600 individuals, poured over 40,000 documents, and spent more than $15 million in their search for Madeline. There has been a fair amount of criticism about how much money has been spent on the investigation into finding Madeline McCann. Also, uh, they've been criticized for getting preferential treatment by British authorities. What's your response to that? If those people who are doing the criticism, it was their child who was missing, would they say the same? They would wish that every other missing child case would get a similar level of resourcing. But by the fall of 2015, those resources would drop significantly when Scotland Yard reduced its staffing from 30 officers down to just four. The work that's been done is just as important, but on a tighter, more managed scale. This sort of work takes time, and of course, as time goes on, it gets harder, but it's not impossible. Back home in England, a decade after their nightmare began, the McCanns faced another somber milestone. Ten years come and gone without any sign of their daughter. Inevitably on the anniversaries and on her birthday, they are the, by far the hardest days, by far. I think it is important uh, though, because despite how difficult these days are, just keeping in mind actually how much progress we have made and whilst there's no evidence to to give us any negative news you know that hope is still there we have made such an emphasis of the point that time is the enemy we've done too good a job of doing that because now the public thinks if you don't recover a child in the first days or weeks or, or months that there's no hope and there are a growing number of cases that demonstrate that there is hope. We get lucky, we get kids back alive, but the not knowing is what kills you, the not knowing. Because without knowing, you're forced to consider the most heartbreaking possibilities. I think the major scenario, because the data tells us, is that whoever took her, took her for sexual reasons. Between 2004 and 2010, a string of sexual assaults were reported in the Algarve region. Almost always houses or apartments that were rented or owned by British people with young children. 
She probably was taken in a crime of opportunity, just the chance for a pedophile to get her, probably without a doubt raped her, more than likely murdered her and buried her somewhere. A theory which British investigators have yet to eliminate. But there are others. A whole series of additional scenarios come into play. Younger children can be taken for purposes of black market adoption. They can be taken for trafficking purposes. They can be taken for a variety of purposes in which the child may not be taken and killed. And if that is the case, Madeline could still be out there. There's no evidence that she's dead. So certainly from my point of view, you know, somebody knows what's happened. Okay, spin around, darling. There is someone who knows what happened to Madeline. Somebody knows. So my message to the McCanns is there's still hope. Are we going to post it today? Never give up hope. Never stop trying to find out what happened to your child. The last time Kate and Jerry McCann saw their daughter Madeline was just days before her fourth birthday. Today, she would be a teenager. While most experts agree it's unlikely they'll ever find her, the McCanns say they still believe in miracles and will never stop searching.